Good everybody and welcome back to our Stock Twits Q&A forum. We're going to be answering your questions live. I'm Brittany Umar. I'm going to be joined by Scott Reller in just a second. But before he joins us, we wanted to show you a quick video. It gives you a sneak peek into Scott's trading world. So check this out. We'll be right back. I'm in a little MGM and I'm still in OIH. I bought it this morning at 107.50. Apple's good. Yeah. You don't buy in the first five minutes of the day. Big. I live in Jersey City. I was born in Long Island. Went to school at SUNY Albany. As a firm, we are five partners and I'm one of them. I am the strategist that puts the game plan together for about 400 traders. I kind of command that army. It's going to make us money with that. Is in the daylight today, if it's up or down three handles, that's when you see where other money is really getting put to work, and that's where the action is. You held 1,600 the whole time? I got 1,000. See, that's a growing experience for you, brother. <laughs> All of the traders trade our money, so they have to be right. They have to say, OK, I think Apple's going from 260 to 265. And if they're right, they make money. It's a good setup. Stick with the win. Okay. It's the right trade. Don't watch it so close. Relax. Scott's coming on in a minute, so we're going to listen to Scott. <laughs> Technicals first. Market looks good. Volume seems a little light. What do you see? Right now, the market's been behaving very well technically. Let's talk to this guy. Now, here's a guy, Scott Redler, who does nothing but technical analysis, but puts his money where his mouth is because he's got a firm and his partners put their money in every day and trade on technical analysis. I'm not looking for a home run. I'm not. It's not a get rich quick scheme. If I'm able to pick the direction of the market, I could book a winning trade and I could provide for my family. <laughs> Where is the breakout? That is the next evolution. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Redler, Chief Strategic Officer at T3 Live. I'm here with Brittany Umar, and we are here for another installment of Conversations, a, a forum where you could ask questions. We can go over anything you want from the markets to our tactics to our lifestyle, anything that you have a problem with when you hear us go over our educational tactics or our um, plays in the media or just whatever you see and whatever you want to ask us, just feel free. And again, you know, Brittany, you've been doing a great job with the names, and, and they're definitely hard <laughs> to read. So don't take it personally if all of a sudden uh, she mangles them, because again, they're, they're pretty interesting. And <laughs> I would say those nicknames, it's funny how some of them come up yeah, with them. Yeah, you guys are pretty creative. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's just jump into our first question. We have one from Dieter Trader asking, how did you arrive at the S&P 1300 to 1320 target that you shared on CNBC in early May? We're there, so is it bounce time? <laughs> I would say uh, at this point we finally got really oversold. Not drastic, but pretty close. And you know, when, when you go into a, another quarter, so if you recall in the first quarter, it was very tactical. Uh, we tried to have a portfolio approach, 13 to 15 trades. We used our tier system to manage them for cash flow and to hold them. And then going into the second quarter, remember I brought in the GOAT, you guys all loved having them here. We were talking, you know what? It's a good time to switch gears. So that was like a little anticipation, like, you know what, we're not going to have the same type of quarter that we had in the first quarter, so let's just see what the market gives us in the second quarter. And then as we started to go through the second quarter, the technicals took over. And if you look at the chart of the S&P, you'll see a few different things here. First, I always talk about this trend because it was great to follow from early October all the way up until it finally broke, you know, in mid-March. And look when it broke. It broke actually towards the end of the first quarter. So with that said, you know, both worlds collide. Then you had to move lower for a, a bounce back up. And then during that process, if those of you who watched the morning call, we started talking about this head and shoulders top pattern, the left shoulder. Here's the head. Okay, as, as some of you also look at off the charts, you've seen this until you're probably sick of seeing this, but this is what you call a distribution pattern. This is a topping pattern. And what this pattern does, it measures distance. So if you look at the high here, this is what, 1422? So 1422 to the neckline. That's what this is in within this pattern. And as you can see, it's pretty symmetrical. It was holding before it gave way. So I would say right around here is when I did that CNBC segment that you were talking about. And I said, there's a good chance that we see 1300, 1320 because from again, 1420 to 1360, that's about 60 handles. So from 1360 takes you all the way down to almost where we closed today, right about 1300. And we did close right there at the lows. So this pattern is now complete. So now we have to figure out what's next. All right. Well, we have one from Max who asks, did you see any signs that this was a sell-off, a capitulation, a flush? 
I think finally you saw a little bit because even guys like me, I was trying to, I would say, go in front of what I thought could be an afternoon move that they would close the market strong going into Facebook. And, and the market was heavy all day. You had uh, the transports week, you had the industrials week, uh, finally some of the home builders started to roll over. So um, for me, today, it just felt like uh, guys were trying to force a trade and I had a bad day and it just didn't work and we closed on our dead lows. And I talk about oscillators getting oversold. For the past two weeks, I've been tweeting saying the McClellan oscillator is only at 40, the oscillator is only at 50, we're only at 60. We're not drastically oversold because remember all that action intraday, they would take us off our lows, they would only close us down marginally. Today, finally, if you look at the bar, if you look at the, the potency, take a look right here, it finally stretched. So when you have a, a wide range bar, like look at this wide range bar, this wide range bar gave you the power for this move. Now, sometimes at the end of it, the wide range bra, you know, bar gives you a little bit of a finish. And if you look right here, going back to another support level, this level right here is um, about 1290. So I would say if we open up around 1290, I will try to get it some kind of cash flow long, especially with Facebook tomorrow. But you have to be calculated because underneath that, you have the 200 day, which is right around 1278. Well, speaking of the McClellan oscillator, we have one from Aloha Trader asking for you to explain your use of that oscillator. He wants to know about trigger levers, trigger levels, where you find its value online. Is it calculated once a day or in real time, he asks. It's calculated in real time. And I just use that almost like some people use the put call ratio. Put call ratio is like a decent gauge when you know everyone's buying puts. It's a, it's the other side, it's the contrarian side. Some people use the bulls bear, you know, the bulls bears newsletter writing. And when the bears start uh, overpowering the, the bulls in a newsletter, they say, okay, now we're getting close. So to me, the McClellan Osley is just another vehicle that I use to, to judge whether or not I think uh, I could try and play a counter trend rally. And every time in the course of the past year, uh, we've, we've had some nice tradable moves from like ne negative 75 down to negative 90. And today it finally hit negative 75. So when it gets to those levels, it's really hard for them to stay there. Almost like when stocks go out of their Bollinger Bands. When you can stretch to the upside out of the Bollinger Band, it can only stay there for so long, same way at the bottom, because you're stretching the rubber band in both directions. So it's another way to measure that. And for me, we're at a spot where um, <laughs> Longs aren't working yet, and I think for me it's hard to be it's hard to be short here, considering the type of move. Considering we just met the measured move of that pattern, so it's been very tricky. The last day and a half actually has been pretty tricky. So know that we're drastically oversold. So you're not all in short here. You know, I think I would think that some of you probably covered into this because if you look again at this chart from. Uh, I would say using tier systems, this was your, your size to get out. You know, when we broke this level, this is when you, you, I would say you had your short initiation or tier one or two, then you came back up and retested it right there. That was another entry. Then you had another entry um, as we broke below this prior pivot, which was right around, if you remember, we were talking about this level here, 1343, so another entry. So at this particular point, to be pressing after uh, almost an 8% move off the highs or more into uh, what's been uh, 10 or 11 down days in a row. I just think it's not prudent, but the same way, just trying to buy it without a plan, you can get run over. And that's why I talk a level versus a level within this environment to trade for cash flow until we see some type of reversal set up, which we haven't seen yet. So what's your go-to indicator for a short-term gut trade? That question from, comes from Howard Lindzen, who says, like today, what got you excited and what vehicle did you trade to feed the urge? <laughs> well, nothing got me really excited today. I, I was just trying to anticipate if they could turn the market today so we can count, you know, count, catch some kind of like counter trend, cute cash flow trade. But, but as I was trying to do it, I was looking at like some of the some of the sectors and in off the charts last night which is one of our products um we talked about the home builders and we said you know what same way you need lower level uh stops you need some higher level stops and i looked at the xhb which has been a leading sector all of a sudden break below the levels we talked about so if you go to the chart we drew this pennant yesterday and this morning and it was on off the charts where we said at this particular point couldn't get above resistance so Get out of the way if it breaks this pen into the downside. And look at this potent move to the downside. So I saw that pressure in the market. So I said, you know what? We pr my gut tells me we're not going to be able to reverse today. And one of the reasons why we put this on off the charts is because Lennar, which is one of the leading home builders, did a small outside day, not extreme. But yesterday we talked about it. I, I think I even tweeted about it. I said, Lennar, small outside day. Why are these home builders going to stay strong when the market's you know, getting pressured here? So look at the wide range bar today. So right there, 
with uh, some pressure on the home builders, which have been strong. So it, it's like one gut instinct sort of negated another. My gut instinct was like, if they're going to try and close this positive, now this afternoon is the afternoon. But when you had the home builders negative, you had the Russell. You take one take a look at the Russell. We've, talking, we've talked about this support level. It's been off the charts also. We've talked about a morning call. You know, and, and Laz educates the fact when you break a certain level at 77.97, uh, it sometimes it hovers there and then look at this move lower the pressure was on these small caps this entire time so we weren't going to rally if we didn't have the small caps there and then also we talked about lulu remember lulu um we, this level here has been holding um first we talked in the morning call today about it uh, pretty extensively how you had a breakout failure you never want to see something break out and come back in like that that's distribution that's not momentum being held and then uh, it was hovering at the support. It was hovering around the 71. And again, with the market breaking lower and things in liquidation mode, it's pretty hard for these stocks to even hold higher. So this was your short entry or just a stop. And now we, you know, we're hitting some moving averages and there's a, a little bit more space below. So right there, one of my instincts was telling me that we, we, they could try and rally, but my gut was telling me, don't just play the cost average game. Because in the beginning of the day, I'm like, I'm gonna buy every 25 cents in the spiders going lower. And then my gut was telling me these things can't bounce with the financials on the pressure, the home builders breaking down, retail not helping. So it kind of, I had a bad day, but at least my gut kept me safe because knowing what's important. And you need conviction to make those sorts of decisions. And we, Shady Capital even asks, what's the key to developing conviction as a trader? Uh, it's really experience. And it's, you shouldn't really have too much conviction because the market changes and people have too much conviction. There's a difference between conviction and a thesis if you have a thesis on something that should happen and then the market doesn't confirm it that's how you get in trouble and that's how you could get beat up we've talked about the thesis of zynga i remember you know six weeks ago or two months ago all of a sudden everyone said zynga is going to be 18 to 20 by the time facebook comes out it was upgraded also after earnings by 10 analysts and look where zynga is so the thesis was zynga the thesis was going to be um, all the way at 18 to 20. And the reality, it's all the way down here at 827 and tomorrow's Facebook. So maybe the pop goes to here. So the technical has told you, look at this outside day. Outside day right there gave you a sell signal. Then look at this wedge that broke to the downside. Then look at this lower pivot that we go over in class all the time around 11 and a quarter. This is where I got stopped out. So if you had a thesis that it had to be at 16 to 20, that thesis can get you in trouble because it gives you an opinion as the technicals didn't, you know, didn't warrant it or they didn't confirm it. Same way a lot of guys said, uh, Wynn, I, I was at the resorts, I, I love Steve Wynn, I love his mantra, da 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 it's gotten beaten up enough, I, it has to bounce and they have conviction that they think it has to bounce. All of a sudden you take a look at Wynn, <laughs> it, it doesn't have to bounce, right? Yeah, look at this, look at the technicals here. That we talk about outside days when it pushes above a level and doesn't hold. This was an outside day. This was, you know what, get out of the way. And then you look at this uptrend that was intact, and this is only a small uptrend back from December, and look at how this broke. And all of a sudden, not a bounce anywhere. These things don't have to bounce if they don't want to. So if you have conviction and the market doesn't confirm it, it gets you in trouble. Now, actually, tomorrow, I think I'll look at this for an 80-20 trade. I'll look at the low of 101.26. Maybe it comes below and comes back above. And lastly, you talk about this outside day on all time frames. Look at the last time it happened. Actually, it was twice. So two times if you used technicals versus conviction, you saved yourself some money. And look at this outside day right here. Right there, this was a sell signal. And then here was another one. And then all of a sudden, patterns repeat themselves. <laughs> there you go again. So you could have conviction, but wait for the market to confirm your plan to then execute what you have the conviction on. Well, we spoke a bunch about oscillators just a few minutes ago, and Sam Patel just sent in a question asking if you could tell him if the S&P oscillator is oversold right now. Uh, it is. It's, it's, it's very oversold, and for the first time, it got a bit drastic. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. I, I'm going to know in the back of my head that we're finally oversold at levels that's going to be hard to sustain to this way. So I'm going to try and combine that with my technicals. So if you look at the technicals here and you look at the spiders, uh, you have a point of reference right here, which is um, coming into this 1290. You also have the 200 day right there. So you take that oversold reading that's now getting drastic, combine it with price points, 
also with a pattern being completed, and then you try and put together the trade, but you wait for the market to confirm it. And now maybe the home builders were beaten up enough, retail just got some air taken out, um, the, the industrials got crushed. So with all that said, maybe there's some room to get an oversold bounce, but it's, we're a long way from a rally. We need like a, a four to 10 day reversal setup before you could do anything more than just a trade. You need that day one, then you need the sideways action, and then you need the follow through. So right now we're just looking for a, an oversold uh, bounce type trade because at this particular point, we're in a downtrend and it's starting to get to the tail end and uh, we'll see if we get that type of setup, but trying it too early can get you in trouble if you don't have a plan or any type of stops. Now, he actually just asks a follow-up saying that a lot of good performers are leaning towards a 200-day moving average. So does that mean that the Dow, the S&P, the Nasdaq are all going there? Well, it, it depends. Uh, a lot of things are actually, a lot of the stronger stocks are getting to their 100-day. So the stocks that hold higher, the stocks that just say hold it their 100-day, while the indices get to the 200-day, those are the ones that should turn first when the market decides to, to bounce, if it decides to bounce. And at this point, I know things look ugly and people are like, oh, the market's horrendous, the world's falling apart. P.S. were 8% off the highs. Last year, we were 22% off the highs. The year before, we were off 17% off the highs. So really, in actuality, as a macro investor, you're doing just fine if you stay the, car, you know, stay the course. But as an intermediate trend trader, which is what I am, or a momentum trader, here you go again. And once we broke this area, this was one uh, sign to get out. This is when IBD went to correction. And then, you know, it went to correction again right here. So if you would have just sold when the trend changed right on this day, uh, at somewhere between 1390 and just say 1380, you've saved yourself 80 handles. And uh, also you, you correlate time of year, May, usually tough, May through July, hard to put in a tradable low. So you put all the dots together and connect them and that's how you maneuver the market. It's not just one thing, it's a whole formula. And then you have to combine that with your share size, your risk tolerance, what you're good at. And, and there's different types of tactics that we try and teach and go over in a lot of our educational courses as well. It's not just picking a stock, having the right idea. You, know, you have to execute on it. And in this type of market, it's, it's a little bit hard to do that. Definitely. And Stats Real actually asks, how do you avoid the temptation of taking profits too quickly? He says he thinks that's something all traders could relate to. Yeah, and that's why we try and use a tier system. So if just say you were riding this downtrend and, and you shorted the spiders at per se, uh, the, the neckline of 1360, you go back to this again, um, here is just say, if you said, okay, we, we broke below this 1360, now we're hovering. So what you do is in this hovering, you stay short tier one, we start to break this lower pivot to get to tier two or tier three, and then you take trades along the way into the measured move. So you book some, stay with some. I'm not an all or none type of guy. I don't buy everything at one price and then sell everything at one price. What you want to do is you want to have just say like this one was support one, support two, support three, support four. We're down to support three. So if they were in tier three, I would say be back to tier one short or, or almost out of it and then just trade the intraday action. So using a tier system could help you stay in a trade longer because you book some, you feel good, and then you trail some. All right, well, we have a bunch of you guys looking for Scott to get out his crystal ball right now. We have Audubon asking, do you think we'll manage to bounce tomorrow? And Cool Daddy also asking, what are the chances we open up tomorrow? What I'd like to do is I'd like to open down tomorrow. We, we've, we've been opening up, and then it's been the same pattern where they open up. They can't sustain it. All the sellers come in, get those prices. It breaks us down, breaks us through the previous low, that pivot. And then we've never really been able to reclaim that pivot for a while. So I think the best case scenario would be to purge it, open down, and then perhaps go lower, see leaders act well, see the financials get a bid, and then you could buy versus that low and then get some type of reversal. And if we go through today's low tomorrow, like just say if you go back to the chart, um, I think what the move that every trader wants right now, um, including me, would be an open down into this 1290 area, you know, maybe even a little bit lower, and then all of a sudden things act well with reverses, trades through yesterday's low, puts in an outside day this way, and then goes sideways and then perhaps bounces. But I think that these bounces are going to be met with a lot of resistance. And if we do get any type of, type of bounce, I would say it's going to be very, very hard for it to get through this 1340 to 1343. So if you're looking for some type of oversold bounce, this is probably all we get for now. But I think one of my other partners who's very good at figuring out where bounces can go to and how you can measure them, he'll be coming in later to show you how to use moving averages so you could use the proper education in order to navigate trends. Yes, we will.
be back with him in just a few. But before that, I think this is really interesting. If you could weigh in, and we have got a little discussion going on on our message boards right now between Grey Dog and Foghorn Returns. Grey Dog asks, what's wrong with AIG? But before you could answer, we've got one from Foghorn saying there's nothing wrong with AIG. The main problem is all this short selling from those hedge funds we build out. So what do you well, think? Weigh in on that discussion. Well, I don't know if either of them are on my virtual trade floor, but in the past three weeks, everyone upgraded AIG. And call me a conspiracy theorist or whatnot. I'm like, why is everyone coming out and upgrading and upgrading AIG? I wish someone would look at the inventory of these firms that upgraded. It seems as if everyone was pushing it to get out of it. So that was my conspiracy theory. I didn't trade it. I was just thinking to myself, I'm like, AIG, um, with everything that's going on? Anyway, you go to the chart, you don't really have to know what's wrong with it. All you have to know is that um, uh, you had a, I guess you go, you can want to draw your lines here. Here is uh, the, the uptrend that's been intact since December. Here is, the, you know, tried to break out right here. This was probably where everyone was upgrading. It was very faulty, very hard to deal with. And then um, this was an outside day that to me, if I was in it, I would have said, I'm getting out of the way, especially if it breaks this support here of 3380. Then you had this gap down, and right? And then it didn't fill the gap. So we, so one of the other uh, tactics we talk about in our education class is that if you have a pro gap and you don't fill it, the power is in the direction of that gap, and this gap was to the downside. So if you were still stuck, I would think you had a salvage this trade once it broke 3087, or at least when it broke this pivot here, which was below this uh, 3034. And now it's coming into some bigger support. I think you missed your chances to sell, and I and I do think if we do get any kind of rally, it's going to have a really hard time getting back above this. So. Um, to me, there, there were a few different um, scenarios that could have got you out, and I, I do hate when five, six, seven firms all upgrade a situation because I think the conspiracy theorist tells <laughs> me that they're getting rid of their stock. Well, Audubon really wants to know about that bounce tomorrow because he's following up with what are you going to look at for a bounce tomorrow? Of course, we have the Facebook IPO. Will we see Facebook-related names possibly bounce? I think some of them might, depending on where it opens and how it performs. I'm going to look to my usual suspects, and I hate to bring them back. Um, Apple is going to be one of them to see if we can get any kind of bounce. We've been talking short Apple uh, a few different times. First was the 620 when it broke, when it showed relative weakness. And then recently we've talked about how if it broke 560 to 555, that it's going to roll down and be a great short. Um, this goes with a pure example of some people who executed well on their idea, on their thesis, on their conviction, and some who didn't. And for me, I didn't short it once today, <laughs> and I was the guy trying to short it to 560, 555, and I think I covered around 551, and now you look at Apple, I'm a little upset with myself because look where it is. So I had a thesis that Apple was going to come in, especially if it didn't hold this earnings gap. So this was your first short entry, then it gapped up on earnings, and then it started to trade lower and then all of a sudden came down and couldn't bounce again. So this was the short entry, right? When it broke this little uh, area, which was, um, I'll get you a little closer so you could see it. And then your ad was when it broke this um, 555. Uh, so to me, I'm like, why did I cover into 551? So to, I was just a little upset with my own performance there. But then someone like Evan, who uses his models a little bit better and maps it out using his educational tactics, he stayed there and he covered today <laughs> and we close at 5.30.12. Uh, so at this particular point, I do think with the, with the size of this move lower, coming into the 100-day moving average and coming into this pivot low here of 5.16, uh, I think that this area could be or potentially could be a better buy. And I'm going to look to see if I could buy it. And then if they open it up, I will trade it versus today's pivot. So my strategy would be if they open it up and try and break it below today's low of uh, 530 and come back up and, and hold the 100 day, I'm a buyer. But then again, with trends, I don't expect too much because there's going to be a lot of resistance probably if it tries to even get back up to retest that big area of 555. So you have to know where it can go and how it can get there and what size you can handle in order to do it. So if Apple could show some strength, Apple helped lead us lower, maybe it'll help tech higher. And then it, you know, JP Morgan's also bleeding lower if it could finally get a bid, then all these things add up and then you can take some spiders, take a few different stocks and try and rub a, a few uh, you know, keyboard <laughs> keys together and uh, put, toge you know, put together some type of bounce. All right. Well, speaking of Evan, as you mentioned, Laz is, of course, the lead educator here at T3. He's going to be joining us in just a minute to answer some of your questions, offer maybe a different point of view. So keep the questions coming. We're just going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after this. Hi, I'm Sean Hendelman, CEO of T3 Live where we train, coach, and mentor traders to understand how to develop an edge in the markets so you can put your money to work with confidence. 
The T3 Live approach includes a mix of training, trading, and technology to help you learn to recognize, adapt, and ultimately take advantage of different market conditions. So what actually separates T3 Live from other educational firms? For one, transparency. We show all of our positions live, so there's no smoke and mirrors. Basically, we put our money where our mouth is. We have to because we're regulated by the SEC and the Chicago Board of Exchange. Number two, we're real traders. You'll be learning from real professional traders that make a living trading their own proprietary trading accounts, not just instructors that don't trade. Your goal should be to associate and learn from big traders who can teach you how to take your trading to the next level. And three, credibility. Millions of people turn to places like CNBC, Wall Street Journal, Fox Business News, and these outlets actually look to T3 Live for information. No other educational firms are asked to be a consistent contributor. We at T3 Live would like to get you started with a step-by-step -step method that has been proven over time. The same blueprint for success that I've gone through. It's not a weekend seminar, it's an approach, a mindset, a process to show you how to take control of your financial future. To begin your training with T3 Live, we would like to offer you the opportunity to enroll in our foundation 30-day online home study course. The reason I'm willing to give you such a valuable course for free is I'm sure that once you complete the program, you'll want to continue your education with our team. All you have to do is fill in your name, email address, and I'll see you on the other side. To our Q and A stock twits forum, we are going to be joined by Scott Rudler and Evan Lazarus in just a second. We want to introduce Laz; he's our lead educator at T3. He's going to offer just a little bit of a different opinion for us. So, Laz, talk about how you trade the <laughs> short side so effectively because you've been doing really well in the downtrend. Well, I think the I think the misconception here is that trading the short side is different than trading the long side. There is one big difference between trading the short side and trading the long side, and that's just speed. Generally, when, when you, know, you get a, a, a downtrend, it's going to happen in a lot faster of a time. So what would take three months or six months to essentially go up could unravel in one week or two weeks. So it's a speed-driven trade, and that speed-driven trade is really driven by the fear that sets into the markets. Things will go down a lot faster than things will go up always. The, 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 the key here is understanding that in bull tapes, you know, bullish markets, you know, if you look at them historically, will go up over years. You know, Bullish markets take time to develop. Greed, you know, as a, as a psychological driver in the market, happens over longer periods of time. Fear, when fear sets in, and again, 2008 wasn't that far away that, you know, we forget that. It's just a fear-driven, panic-driven, speed-oriented trade. So it's not that technically it's different. You're doing the same approach. Just like in a bull tape, you're going to buy pull-ins into rising averages. In a bear tape, you're going to sell bounces into declining moving averages. And this is stuff we teach in our active trading course, you know, that, that, that should be, I think if you're an active trader navigating the ebbs and flows or an intermediate term trader and not necessarily a macro investor, these are, these are skill sets that you need to have to thrive in all market conditions. Because if you are going to trade the stock market or trade individual symbols, you need to be prepared for both the ups and the downs. That's going to make you more versatile. It's going to make you a, a heck of a lot more money. And you're going to be prepared and understand why things are happening. I think the trader that really can answer the question why why are we going down? Just like why we're going up and back it up and support it with good technicals is going to be a confident decision maker. And that confident decision maker ultimately becomes a successful trader, in my opinion. Well, we have some questions on some of the educational things that you've been doing here. You've been holding webinars. And Mr. Uno here actually saw your webinar on gaps yesterday. He said, great stuff, but wants to know if you can explain what a sell setup is. He says he heard you mention it a few times. Okay. Uh, a sell setup is a technique for entry. So if you're looking for, let's say, an entry in a stock, whether it's a long entry or a short entry, you know, in a sell setup, we're actually going to use it in this, in this instance, we're going to look at it from a, an, an entry technique from a shorting perspective. You're going to look to short a bounce into a declining moving, at, into a declining moving average. Today is actually a good example of a trade we took on the VTF. Um, here's Baidu. And from an intraday perspective, for those that were trading intraday, this is what we call a sell setup, where you get <clears throat> a strong surge down. Again, not notice your 8 and 21, which is the blue and orange lines here, declining. That's going to dictate direction. You get a strong surge down, which you see here early, and you get a 3 to 5 bar bounce, which you see right here. 1, 2, 3. Into a declining moving average, it undercuts a prior bar's low right here. 
That's an entry technique that we teach in the Active Trader course, and it allows you to A, time into a trade, and more importantly, B, evaluate the risk. So in this particular sell setup, you're not only dictating how you get in and where you get in, but you're dictating which direction and essentially predefining what the risk is. So sell setup is essentially an, an, a way to initiate into a trade. A lot of traders don't know how to execute. So it's an execution piece. So if you want to be involved in a stock, whether it's long or short, this is going to be a good approach to teach you how and where and when and why to get involved. Now, Scott, would you approach that any differently? It's funny, every trader has different techniques and I use those moving averages, but I also use patterns. And within that pattern of your cell setup, there's also a pattern that I watch. So if you give me the little cue board here, you see um, on, on a different perspective, you have with the same strategy, you have a bear flag, right? You have uh, two big potent bars to the downside, or you could even do another thing where it couldn't take back uh, a third of that move. So this move showed power. And if I would have known that I could short it into these moving averages, so I've been trying to learn some of this material as well from a different standpoint, because we all have to learn as we go. You know, you also have this bear flag, right? Here is the move from uh, this little rally of 122 all the way down. And then what did it set up? It set up a basic bear flag. So you have a bear flag within this sell setup pattern. So if you know both techniques, if you're educated on how to use these moving averages and also use patterns, Bear flags typically give you continuation. So right here, when it bounced back up into the moving average, you could have sold some. And then when you had your follow through, through the low of this bear flag, you could have added for another additional move from 119 as low as 117. So when you can combine all the educational techniques, whether it's using your moving averages, using chart patterns, that's what finally gives you the conviction. People are asking, how do you get conviction? You don't get conviction in an idea unless the market confirms it. And both those strategies confirm this move to the downside, and that's how you make money, shorting stocks with a sell setup. Essentially, it's, it's the same thing. The, the reason that I think you know, the sell setup or the buy setup or some of the strategies we teach in the Active Trader course are valuable is because it objectively can help a trader put rules into place. It doesn't matter what you call it, or what he calls it or what I call it, it's, it's basically defining a, a tactic for entry. And, and traders need, you know, successful traders need tactics in terms of entry and exit and risk. Our job as traders, as I said in our last Stock Twits um, presentation, Brittany, was that, you know, as a, as a professional trader, whether you look at it the way Scott does or the way I do, or how you define it, we're professional risk analysts. That's what we really are, because our job is to analyze and mitigate risk. We're supposed to look for areas where we can get into a position, time a trade, and understand the risks associated with it. So this is a tactic that helps define risk. And that, at the end of the day, is the most important part. All right, well, Laz, we have another education question for you here from Dieter Trader saying, Laz, I'm in main virtual trading floor looking into course and private room mentoring. How does the private mentoring work? Okay, so private mentoring works. Um, it's a really interesting thing that we put together. Everything we do here at T3 Live is, is on the education side is, is virtual. Um, a trader goes through, takes the active trader course. Uh, it's it's a pretty comprehensive, you know, you can be done in as little as two days, but some usually take it, you know, over the course of many days. Um, it's on demand. And then you actually get to sit and work with me intraday, real time, in a private forum where we can interact. You can see my charts. This is an example of this buy, do, trade. Today was an example of something we took in the active trader room. Uh, today, a trade that all the, you know, the students, the mentees, were looking at for a sell setup. We, we defined you know, the time frame analysis, we looked at it on the analytical time frames, we looked at it on the ex ex execution time frames, we put a lot of the pieces of the puzzle that we study together, and we boiled it down to where is the trade, what is the trade, what is the risk, and what is the potential target. And just as an example, again, highlighting this one trade today because it's fresh in my mind, all the mentees and all the students in the active trader uh, room were looking to short this stock right at this level. We put our stops a couple pennies above this pivot high. We used our FIB extension tool again, which is another tactic we teach here in the Active Trader Room, to evaluate potential profit targets. Profit target number one was down here at 18.35, and profit target number two was down here at 116.35. For those that took this as a day trade, it was a very, very nice day trade. And again, it's all about defining the risk. So in the mentor program, you get to really work hands-on with the, trade, the, the mentors like myself to really define and hone the skills you learn in the class. All right. We have an interesting thought that just came in from Ken saying, amazing, last Thursday, JP Morgan announces $2 billion trading loss and market is down huge since then. Makes you wonder. So you guys want to weigh in on that? 
I'll, be, I'll weigh in on that one because I think I was here when someone uh, actually typed in and said the banks are all down big. What do you make of it? I had no idea what was going on because we were in here asking questions. And what Evan talks about is defining your risk. And you don't want to have a thesis unless the market confirms it. So if you remember that day, you know, JP Morgan gapped down and everyone's like, okay, is a $2 billion loss a really big deal? What's going to go on? Where could the support be? So as a trader, you define your risk. So I said to myself, you know what, I'm going to see if this stock could bounce into a certain support area. And if it doesn't, I know what my risk is and I'll get out of the way. So if you go to the chart real quickly at JP Morgan, you will see that this is what happened that day. All right. It had a, a big gap down because everyone got scared, and rightly so. And you talk about gap analysis, if you can't fill that gap within that day, typically that's the gap that controls it because it's a pro gap and it leads the direction. So if you take another step further, for me, um, I, I use price pivots. So right away you had your, your two-day down move. So I said, okay, I'm gonna try and give this a chance for a bounce. So I'm gonna give it, on this day, this is when Jamie Dimon was speaking. So I knew, okay, I'm gonna try and play a, a bounce. Maybe it can get up to, where the gap started at 37.99, another tactic that I use, saying that gaps have resistance, but typically they go and test it. I couldn't even do that. And I said, I'm gonna get out once it breaks this pivot low, because then you have no idea where it's gonna go. So two days ago, it broke below that low of 35.76. And that also gave you some clues that the market's gonna stay under pressure, because if JP Morgan is making new lows here, obviously the banks are gonna follow and the market's gonna follow. So today you had another gap down. So if you sold here, because you're like, you know what? It didn't hold this lower pivot area, even though it had a big move from 46. Who cares? It's not ready to bounce. You didn't, you, you weren't in the way here for this area. And then this morning and morning call, we talked about this 34 area, which was a nice trade off the open. If you want to take a quick look, because I think guys made cash flow there. So if you were prepared with that area off the bat, look what happened here, right? It came right into the low, which we talked about in the price point here, 3403. And it gave you a small little bounce for cash flow to 34.75, so you made 75 cents. And then, you know, you want to look at these tactics and, and time frames. I bet you last can talk all day about how these moving averages controlled the stock, which wound up making new lows at the end of the day. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll, I'll, just to weigh in on this, you know, more importantly than the short-term cash flow tactics, so the fact that, you know, this is what a broken chart looks like. This is a broken chart. It's been broken for a long time. When you're when you deal with you know technicals like this that are highly you know exaggerated in one direction or the other you know there's going to be a lot of volatility and there's going to be a lot of fear in that trade so you know what I always tell traders is that if you're not comfortable with risk rewards in, in a in a in a broken trade these are trades not meant for advanced traders like Scott or myself novice even intermediate term traders you know trying to get involved in 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 these story stocks that have broken patterns with a lot of fear is a high risk game. And if you're not comfortable with the risks involved, you know, we always tell the traders, the, the, the students in the class, these are not trades built for you. However, you can work with them tactfully and technically, right. the risks are elevated. This is a trade that essentially has been broken since it broke support back up here at 42. It broke that pivot support at 42. You know, it hovered for a day or two and then the news came out and that's what just accelerated the downside. Like I said, what takes, and this, this is a great example, what takes, you know, six months to go up in a fear-driven trade can unwind in six days. And that's something that you have to be prepared for if you're going to actively trade this market. You're going to see it again. You're going to see, you know, you know, nice uptrends develop again. You're going to see fast down moves develop again. It's cyclical. Everything about what we do is cyclical. You're going to see these pockets where, you know, you get, periods of, of, of bull markets and then, you know, the moving averages and the, and the price action changes and, and, and things. And this is a great example of it. Well, it's, it's a, an example of how the, the chart, you didn't have to know that a, a big write down was coming, but the chart told you it was technically broken. I remember that day, Correct. the market tried to bounce and the financials closed on the lows of that day. So thank goodness a lot of us were not long overnight because like, you know what, why are the banks closing on the lows of the day? They should be leading the market. They didn't another tactic or rule that we have in our head through experience. And P.S. that day, thank goodness they closed in the lows, so a lot of people uh, weren't caught in what was a, a pretty much a disaster. And some people probably were short because they showed relative weakness. So, so momentum guys, one of their rules is you go out on the lows of the day, you take it short, and if you get continuation, because that's all you can ask for as a trader, is follow through, downside follow through, if the follow through is to the downside, you know, same way on upside follow through, something you know, closes strong with an igniting bar on heavy volume. Typically momentum traders will take that because the buyers are in control. So it's all about who's in control. And lately, obviously the sellers have been in control. So you have to go with who's in control. If you look actually, Scott, it's a good point. If you look at the XLF, 
which is the ETF for the financials, and you look at a monthly chart, just to get you know a good macro, multi-year look at this chart, you'd see that what was 2008, you know, into the bottom, the lows of 2009. Look at the retracement here in the XLF. Really, really poor. This is a, this is a, this is an ETF for a sector that's probably setting up for much lower prices. You know, again, the short term and the <laughs> long term are different. But these banks, a lot of these banks that make up the sector, have been unhealthy, and they've been unhealthy for a while. So it's not utterly surprising. We look at Goldman Sachs again. If we look at a shorter term, as the as the S and P's were, you know, making new highs for the last three months, Goldman Sachs has been in a downtrend. You can see every snap. Again, this is again a tactic, a sell setup. Every snap into this 21 period MA has been an area. To look to sell a bounce. So now, again, at some point, it just accelerates. So this has sort of been happening for a while. It just hasn't really been looked at, and I think discussed as deeply as maybe it should have. So the banks let us higher. The banks will lead us lower. It's been happening for a while. Exactly. Now maybe you guys can weigh in on a little discussion that's going on again on the message boards. We've got Ken asking, "Is gold finally a buy?" But before I could ask you, we have Masked as a Sheep weighing in, saying, "Ken, gold is in a bear market. Look at the moving averages. Expect a technical bounce. May see a gap fill up to 159-ish area." So, what do you guys think about that? Well, yesterday in the morning call, the thesis was commodities. Not because I thought that gold all of a sudden had an identity, or because I had a fundamental thesis. All because on a price point sheet or on a price level, gold on the intermediate level was coming in to test that December pivot. So if you go to the chart on an intermediate level, you take a look here. It was worthy of at least a cover, let alone a bounce. So this was the line that I drew, and this is why I said, guys, if you've been short gold, just pay a little attention here. We're coming into a pivot. Can it hold? Maybe, but at least if you know you did get short when it broke this、uh, pennant type of strategy right here, it's a good spot to cover. So if you do the right trade, usually you get rewarded. But at least、uh, you book some. So yesterday it came into this low. Okay, the low here was 148.27. So you didn't have to know what really was going to happen today, and and that held. So good spot to cover after a big move lower, extended from the moving averages, and then today it filled the gap. So in me, in in, in my rationale, with my tactics. That showed a little power. It negated this downside gap. So at least if you're short, you would put back on your toes a little bit. So I would say, someone asked me today, where could gold go? So by just purely using the technicals, I would say、uh, this was your old support. That should turn into resistance. You have another gap here. So I would say if you're trading it for an oversold bounce and not worrying about a new trend, that's probably where it goes. Can go to 156. If there's a bit more power, maybe they could squeeze some portion of this gap to 158. But you're going to see a lot of resistance going into here. And if you want to take a bigger approach, a more macro approach on gold, and if you look at the monthly, you will see we we drew this also how、um, you know this trend that was right here came all the way up and this broke. So this upper pennant on a monthly chart. Broke to the downside, and at first, typically you hold big levels, so it's trying to hold that pivot. But if it can't get back above this line that I just drew, chances are it goes sideways. It breaks this, and then you have that pivot all the way. I think I don't know. Actually, this is a one down here, but I think this is what we drew on off the chart, which is like 140. So two important things is know your time frame and have your ideas mapped out. So this way, the market can confirm it, and you know where your your objectives are, so you could act when they get there, and you don't get caught in the emotion. Last、well, any thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think Scott's got it right on the head. The, the key to what he said, I think, is knowing your time frame. What are you? Are you a short-term gold trader, or are you a long-term fundamental, you know, gold driver bull. gold bull?、Um, the, the one thing that I think stands out here is this, you know, multi-year trend line. It is broken. When things do that on these larger time frames, to me, it's a symbol that you know all is not well. It's not a safe investment. Things have changed. You know what makes us money as traders, whether you're an investor or a short-term trader, is the movement of price. We all look for the movement of price. That's where everybody makes their money. Price goes up, we make money. Price goes down, we make money. You have to recognize when something is changing on these macro time frames. And this, to me, tells me that with this precious, you know, precious metal and gold, you know, we've had a massive run since. And Scott's been all over this for a long time. From you know 2005, 2006, we have been in a nice. You know we've had a nice move here. So now we are fast forward 2012. It's been in a multi-year uptrend. The trend is now broken. That's the time to get out. You know to me and go to cash and wait till something changes or a bullish pattern sets up that we can then 
dip, you know, t put our hands in the water, dip our feet in the pool, yeah. and, and potentially look to, to, to get back in long term. Right now, it's not a safe play. On a smaller time d daily chart, you know, as Scott highlighted, yes, there are the nimble, you know, prior support plays for the shorter term traders. You know, overall, not necessarily a healthy looking pattern here. Um, we broke back in, in mid-February. We spent about two months just gyrating and gyrating, trying to get the bulls back involved. And now we finally, you know, broken lower. So, you know, it depends on what you are. But to me, it's not the right play for the, both the longer term or the shorter term right now. Unless you're trading, you know, prior support, prior resistance for one to three day cash flow type of trades, that's really, to me, it. Now, as you both have different trading styles, answer Red Diesel who asks, do you have a maximum amount of positions that you're willing to have on at the same time? Well, it all depends on the market. Uh, in, in December through March, people who were on the site were like, wow, Red, are you holding a lot of positions? The VIX was low. We were in a nice uptrend. I was holding 13 to 15 positions because the market was making me money. I was trading around them using a tier system, holding some when the, when the price pattern set up again, nice and tight for expansion. I would add to it. I would book some, stay with some. And I probably had the best quarter that I've had uh, in, in my career, actually. And then going into the second quarter, just thinking, you know what, might be decent. I had G-Toy here to take some off. It would probably not have the same type of gains we had in that first quarter. I went to, you know, cash flow approach, tactical approach. And then obviously we started to have those distribution days and then we started to correct. So in the beginning part of the correction, since I'm not very comfortable being short a lot of positions, I was short the spiders and short some tactical plays. And I, I brought my, my, my stock positions down and my time frame down. You know, so now at the tail end of just say what could be the eighth inning of this uh, first phase of the corrective phase, or maybe the tail end, or who knows, you don't know that, I've been just trying to keep it simple, not having eight, 12 shorts out there. And I've been throwing out short ideas. Like we talk about, you know, on off the charts and, and in our educational courses, that you, same way you could hold eight, 12, 15 positions on the way up, why can't you do it on the way down? But for me, I'm just not as comfortable doing that, so I need to know myself. So for that, I just tried to be short in some things, and, and just grow and make money on the way down also the same way I could do it on the way up, and that just takes time. Well, I think, you know, this is a great question because in trading, you know, we get this a lot. In trading, just like in sports or anything, if, if I had a, uh, a player on my team who was a fantastic jump shooter, would I want him shooting jump shots? Yes, I would. I wouldn't want him, you know, underneath trying to, to box out for rebounds. You have to know what your strengths are and you have to play to your strengths. Most successful traders, whether you're a bull, whether you're a bear, it doesn't really matter. You have to know what you're good at, whether it's short-term day trading, swing trading off of you know, pivots or whatever you, know, whatever you think is your best skill set is really what you look to maximize. It's not about trying to do everything and do everything, everything great. Nobody can do everything great. It's impossible. I can't manage positions as well to the long side as Scott can. My skill set generally thrives in a down tape. So I know that when I get those types of scenarios, that's when I look to you know, maximize my skill set. So it's not about doing everything and doing everything well. Nobody can do everything well. It's impossible. It's about understanding what's in your wheelhouse and playing to those strengths. And just on, just on that topic, okay, with Evan just said very eloquently, is that um, guys sometimes on stock twits are so like, are you guys day traders? Uh, will I get any value out of your, your, you know, your, your service, your education, if um, I have a full-time job and, and I can't be trading every day, all day long, I was like, of course you can. Because obviously we trade intraday because that's when the market's open, so primarily that's when we take on our risk. But if you were a swing trader, or if you were um, just managing a portfolio, don't you think you, go back to that, Evan, don't you think you would have wanted to learn our tactics where when IBD put us in a market correction, when we saw the distribution days, when you saw our virtual trade flow go from 13 to 15 positions down to almost zero, don't you think you could have saved yourself some money also, even if you don't trade professionally, but you just wanted to know the composure of the market? Don't you think you could learn something if you knew technical analysis, look at this chart, and you see that once we broke this, uh, 1390, that was an exit on some of your positions, or once uh, IBD put us in correction right in here, you could have sold some stock and you could have saved yourself about 50 or 60 handles on the way down. So even if you don't trade every single day, all day long, hundreds of thousands of shares, you want to know the complexion of the market. And then what you do is you put that over your time frame and then you use it as a vehicle that, that benefits your life because uh, in the market, you need to know what's going on. You don't have to be a, a professional trader to make money from the market. You just need to know how to approach it based on your, your risk, your skill set, and, and what you're good at. And you can get anything you want from the site, whether it's a active trading course, a momentum trading course, a swing trading course, but you, you should have a, a broad knowledge base 
besides the, the, the actual tactics within there so you could navigate any time frame and just be safe when, you know, the, the talking heads, which I guess I'm one of, say something, you know, and they have a thesis, you want to make sure the technicals confirm it and you don't get caught buying AIG after four upgrades when technically it was pretty broken, to go back to that other question. All right, well, we have to save our last question for probably the biggest headline going into tomorrow, Facebook. Max is asking, I'm sorry, iWild was asking, what's the Facebook effect on the markets? Will it just be tomorrow or will it carry into next week? I'll start with that question just because people thought we would have a Facebook effect going into Friday and we've been selling off so don't have any kind of thesis about that. The question is what time frame do you want to trade it? And I know most of you guys out there watching this, you're not getting 10, 15,000 shares of allocations that you could sell if it opens up 10, 15 dollars and you could high five. You're not a member of the company or employee that has stock options at the Kazoots. You want to know whether or not you could buy it on day one, day 45, and, and, and profit from it and be safe. So if you're an active trader like we are, we have an art of the first day. So we're going to trade Facebook. You should tune into the virtual trade floor if you ever wanted um, a, a free trial. Tomorrow's a day or tonight's a day to log in and, and get there because these guys traded well. You know, I, I gave a for instance this morning with LinkedIn. Okay, I don't have that chart right here, but um, you know, if I gave you a hypothetical, I'm just going to give you a quick, quick hypothetical on what could happen tomorrow. Obviously, it's priced at like 38. So just say this is the way we trade it. Um, if it's priced at 38 and opens up, we'll give you a round number at just say 45. Typically you get a first quick push. You get a push up, just say that's 45 to 47. And then all of a sudden everyone that has the deal stock, every you know, guy that, that's riding this deal starts selling it. All the free money guys that are, are selling it, they're gonna try and sell it. So the market makers obviously pull it in because they're not gonna give them the best prices. So supply comes in. So the question is, where does that demand come in? So right away, you write down 45, you write down 47, then the supply comes in, it comes down. Just say it comes down to like 43, and then it comes off of that to back to 45, that's an entry. You could buy at 45 versus the low of 43, it's calculated, you know your risk. Evan talks about risk all the time in the classes. That's a two-point risk. And then it goes sideways at 45, you're in tier one, another tactical setup. It starts going sideways, you add, and then if it gets above, that high price of 47, then that's your momentum trade. That's when you add and then you, you tear out of it based on how fast the movement is. If you guys remember LinkedIn real quickly, if I could just give you the quick rundown, it opened up at like 80, went to like 92, came back to 84. You could have bought 84 versus 80, started to turn up. Then it started to get through 88. You could have bought a little bit more, went sideways. And once it traded above that high 92, it went to 120. Not saying that's gonna happen, but if, but if it doesn't get above that opening price or that 30 minute pivot high price, it's not worth your time. That means there's too much supply and not enough demand. So the first day is gonna pretty much be horrible <laughs> for anyone not involved. And then if you're an investor, typically you wait six to eight weeks and you let, you let it sift out. You let the institutions build a pattern. We'll have the pattern here. We'll show it when it breaks the downtrend or whatnot and, and you wait. So there's, a, there's an art to the first three days to see if there's any momentum for an active trader. And then there's an entry, if it's worth your while, probably four, six, or eight weeks after it's proven and after it's built a pattern that you could trade from. <laughs> That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, again, this is one of those things where nobody knows, I don't know. I'd be remiss if I were to, you know, put some plan in place. I don't know where it's going to open. I don't know how the market's going to react to it. Um, I will know tomorrow when I see price. If there's a good setup there, which I think is really what the underlying current of what Scott's saying, if there's a good setup there intraday, there'll be a trade. Um, other than that, I don't think it's really worth discussing all that much. It's not in the S&P 500. It's not index related. I don't think it's going to move the market. I think it's more headline driven and it's going to be driven more by the media than anything else. Again, as traders, we have to look at the way price moves. We are price sensitive individuals. If it goes up and there's a good entry strategy, we'll look to trade it. If it isn't and there isn't, we won't. That's just kind of a black and white approach to how I think, you know, I, I'd like there to be a, a nice trade in. I think it would be a very interesting scenario, but I can't, you know, I certainly can't make that prediction. But I can tell you, but I can tell you before we go, because Scott and I are happy-go-lucky today, <laughs> is that with my active trader course, uh, we're going to offer a more than 50% off to anybody in the stock, t stock twits community. 50% um, off? More than. More so it's a $2,000 class. We're going to do it for eight ninety seven for today only. Um, because the stock twist community has given so much back to us, 
and I'm on stock tweets and Scott's on Scott stock tweets. And, you know, we get so many questions about how we trade and what we look at and what we do. This really is a soup to nuts look at, you know, how we approach the markets from, from you know, before the day starts to, to game planning to, you know, using fibs to moving averages to price setups to buy setups. You know, a really, really soup to nuts look at this. And um, again, I think you'd be remiss, especially if you're in the more novice camp, you know, sub two years of trading and you really need, you know, sort of that foundation to build upon. Um, it's everything that Scott and I have, you know, know about trading built into a, you know, into a class. So if you go to T3 Live on the homepage, and I, I brought it up here real quick to show you, and you click here on the left, Active Trader Course, and you uh, enroll now. In the promo code, you just want to write the word stock twits. And it will automatically load with that 897 discounted price. Again, it's from 2000 to 897, and that's for today only because Scott and I are happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a well, Facebook, Facebook sale. <laughs> we're looking for just motivated individuals yes. that want to learn. Because again, there's so many guys who follow us on Stock Twit, so many guys who say, oh, I, I read about your Red Dog Reversal, I, I've read about the candlesticks, how to use your tiering system, all these things. Th this active trading course really combines probably the, the 14, 15 years worth of experience we have wrapped up into a manual and a course that could give you just such a head start if you're two to, two to three years into trading or three to five years, or even if you've been doing it 15 years, it doesn't matter. This is everything we've learned combined into one with our approach, with our tactics, and you know, one good trade pays for that course, and I can't believe we're giving them 50 to 60 Well, the, the question is, and we can wrap it up, the question is why? It helps traders, and this is what I tell traders all the time, answer the question why. Why am I long? Here's why. Why am I short? Here's why. What's my risk? Why? What's my target? Why? So you really need to answer that question in all facets of what you do in order to be successful and have longevity in this business. You know, be consistent and get yourself to the point where, you know, you understand what you do. You understand why you do what you do. That's, that's, when, that's when the question that's earlier that's about that's conviction, when you get conviction. Yeah, that's your question about conviction yeah. is being able to say, here's why I am in this position. That understanding and that foundation leads to that conviction. Well, it's a great product. It's a great offer. I'm sure you guys are all going to take advantage of that. Thank you, Laz. Thank you, Red Dog. Thank you guys for sending in such great questions. We'll meet you here same time next Thursday. Have a great night.